Hey everyone, it's Pixar's latest feature, Luca. Luca, did you miss me? No, not that, Luca, this one. And since I can't actually travel to the beautiful Italian seaside town of Porto Rosso, one, because it doesn't exist, and two, I legally can't leave my country because of coronavirus, Pixar's latest entry will just have to do. So in this video, we'll be taking a deep dive, and yes, the puns will get worse, into the ending, as well as the film's many hidden Easter eggs. But before we begin, hit that like and subscribe button. Seriously, only 8% of you are subscribed, so that I can finally afford a sweet, sweet Vespa. Welcome to the fictitious town of Porto Rosso, Italy, which literally translates to Red Port. And you're going to witness me totally butcher Italian. Gorlami. Porto Rosso itself is an easter egg for Pixar's upcoming animated film Turning Red, but we'll get to that in a bit. We see the fishing boat Gelsamina puttering out to sea, and the name Gelsamina translates to Jasmine from Disney's Aladdin. The two fishermen here have a map which pinpoints where Porto Rosso is located in the Ligurian Sea, which is located in northern Italy near Genoa, the place Luca will eventually go to school. But notice here the images of sea monsters. It's not even the first minute and Pixar is already setting up one of the main conflicts of the movie. The land people see the sea creatures as murderous monsters to be feared, and the sea creatures see land people as murderous monsters to be feared. You think they come around to meet new friends, huh? No. Make small talk. I, I, I don't. No. They're here to do murders. Oh. Luca teaches us that we can't judge a book by its cover, that even though we may not understand someone or something, it doesn't mean that it needs to be feared. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. On the boat is an old record player that plays Giacomo Puccini's O Mio Babino Caro, which is all about a young woman wanting to go to Porta Rosso, which is strikingly similar to Luca wanting to go to Porto Rosso. The little trinkets that fall into the ocean, like the cards and the clock, are similar to those found in Ariel's trinket cove in The Little Mermaid. We next meet our story's protagonist, Luca, a young fish herder who's completely bored with his life. Like Ariel, he yearns to be free and explore the land up above, but is held back by his parents. We do not talk, think, discuss, contemplate, or go anywhere near the surface. That is until he meets Alberto. Alberto shows him that sea creatures can also live on land, although if they touch water, they reveal their true selves. Unlike Luca, however, Alberto doesn't have a family. His father actually abandoned him, saying he's old enough to be on his own. And that's the thing Alberto wants more than anything else, to be wanted, to be loved. And he gets that through his friendship with Luca. However, when Julie arrives, it puts a serious wedge in his relationship. You see, Luca and Alberto plan to buy a Vespa so the two of them could be free. Luca runs away from home and his parents after he finds out they're sending him to be with his strange uncle Ugo, played by Sasha Baron Cohen, far away from the dangers of the surface. Uncle Ugo literally lives in the complete opposite place that Luca wants to go, the deep sea, far away from the light, which is ironic since the name Luca means bringer of light. But halfway through the movie, Luca's plans change. He wants to go to school to learn more about the world and the universe, meaning that Alberto will once again be abandoned. This causes a rift between the two, ultimately leading to one of the most heart-wrenching scenes of the film, where Luca turns on Alberto after it's revealed he's a sea monster, casting him back to sea. But Luca isn't evil, far from it. We see the pain in his face as he betrays his friend, a betrayal he'll later apologize for. He'll see the drawing Alberto made ripped in two and the markings for each day Alberto had been alone without his father. Luca realizes, as do we, that Alberto's emotions stem from the abandonment of his father, that everyone in his life that he's gotten close to has left him. This is why, at the end of the film, Alberto decides to stay with Massimo, Julia's father. It's a win-win. Alberto gets a father figure, and Massimo gets help with fishing and a companion for when Julia is with her mother. There's also this extra layer of both characters knowing what it's like to be different. Massimo only has one arm, something he tells Alberto he was born with, just like Alberto was born different being a sea creature. At the end of the film, Alberto ends up selling the Vespa, the one thing he was working for throughout the entire movie, so that he can pay for Luca's train ticket. He has put his friend before himself. The ticket is an easter egg as well. A113 is the classroom at the California Institute of the Arts where many Pixar animators study. Even the train number 94608 is the zip code for Emeryville, California, where the Pixar headquarters are located. Alberto and Luca decide to travel to Porto Rosso in order to acquire a real Vespa. They believe that a Vespa is their ticket to freedom. Even the poster says Vespa is freedom. What Alberto 
Roberto and Luca learn throughout the film is that it isn't the Vespa that makes them free. Freedom isn't an object. It's the ability to make your own choices. And that's what Luca does throughout the movie. He ends up traveling to Puerto Rosso with Alberto and teaming up with the local outcast Julia to compete in the annual Puerto Rosso Cup, which, if they win, can get them some sweet prize money for their coveted Vespa. It's here we're also introduced to the main villain, Ercole Visconti. Ercole translates to Hercules, and Visconti was the name of a noble Italian family which ruled Milan and Lombardy from 1277 to 1447. Around town you'll notice a ton of unique posters influenced by movies from the era, such as Roman Holiday and a Disney film 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. A poster for Fellini's La Strada and a fake movie Attack of the Sea Monster appear. I like how they even included a fake actor whose name is really close to Julia Roberts. Speaking of Julia, there's nothing more that Julia wants to do than defeat Ercole and prove herself to the town. She's considered an outsider, so it's fitting she ends up teaming up with two other outsiders. In fact, Ercole says, Fine, go start the club! For losers! Which a young redhead in a losers club just makes me think of it. She vows that she'll be the one to take down Ercole. So no one's taking him down unless it's me! Which foreshadows how she'll be the one at the end to sacrifice herself by crashing her bike into Ercole so Luca and Alberto can win. Luca and Alberto stay with Julia, and I love how her cat is named Machiavelli, after the 15th century philosopher who was famously known for saying it is much safer to be feared than loved. A quote which is subtly referred to when Julia says, this of Ercole's followers, they don't love you, they're afraid of you. Which is exactly the case, as Ercole's two henchmen, Guido and Cecchio, end up tossing him into the fountain at the end of the movie. Fun fact, the guy who voices Cecchio is the director of Pixar's The Good Dinosaur. Luca's world is opened up even wider when he finds out that there's a world far beyond Porto Rosso. In a great dream sequence, he flies around the Colosseum in Rome in Leonardo da Vinci's flying machine. We even get a glimpse at another Disney character, Pinocchio, who is based off a 1883 novel, The Adventures of Pinocchio by Carolo Collodi. In Julia's room, you can even make out a duck that wears a similar outfit to Donald Duck. With the cup just a day away, things fall apart for our group of outcasts. Alberto is cast out to sea, and Julia finds out Luca is a sea monster too. So only Luca and Julia end up competing in this grueling marathon that involves swimming, eating pasta, and a treacherous bike race. But Luca can't swim like the others, or else he'll be revealed as a sea creature. So he gets in one of those old-timey swimsuits, probably the same one Alberto used at the beginning, and I think these things were also used in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. But where things start to get real hairy is the final portion, the bike race. It's starting to rain and Luca is in the lead, but will he risk revealing himself in order to win? And that's when Alberto arrives, risking his own life to protect Luca with an umbrella, which ironically was part of his initial drawing. The previous night, Luca promised that he'd win the race for Alberto so they can take the Vespa and explore the world together, and now Alberto has come to save the day. The funny thing about Luca's pep talk to Alberto that previous night was how the roles have reversed. In the beginning, Alberto told Luca to silence that voice in his head that tells him he can't do things. He calls the voice Bruno, saying, Silencio Bruno, which is likely named after his dad who told him to be quiet. Now it's Luca telling Alberto to silence that voice so that they can live out their dream together. Luca ends up saving Alberto from Ercole in the three race to the bottom with Julia sacrificing herself in order for Luca and Alberto to win. However, in the process, their true selves are revealed. It's Massimo, the man who we first saw cutting off fish heads and with a hatred for sea creatures, who stands up for them, declaring them the winners of the race. It even turns out that the two snarling grannies from the beginning were sea creatures in disguise all along too. It just goes to show you that you never know who someone is deep down inside. People shouldn't have to hide who they are. Luca's grandmother puts it best when she says, Some people, they'll never accept him. But some will. <laughs> and he seems to know how to find the good ones. In other words, there will be people like Ercole in the world, and there will also be Julia's. Find the Julia's. Alberto and Luca give up their dream of owning a Vespa, but that's okay. Dreams change, and sometimes what we think are our dreams aren't exactly what we need. For example, both Alberta and Luca think that they want a Vespa, but what they need is something totally different. Alberto needs the love of a father, and Luca needs his parents to let go. If you want a more 
more in-depth analysis of the difference between want versus need, I did a whole video using Toy Story, Lord of the Rings, and The Matrix as examples which I'll leave in the link to the description. The film ends with Luca on the train to start his new life, fully accepting who he is, watching the isolated island where his journey started fade into the distance. It's a beautiful moment where the frame is partly raining with sun shining through, emblematic of our character now part of two different worlds, of land and sea. Now I do want to end on a few easter eggs that I couldn't quite fit into the main part. As the racers make their way down the mountain, you can briefly see a Planet Pizza Toy Story delivery scooter in the back, as evidenced by the planet-shaped ornament on the top. You'll even see a Lux Ball, which is an easter egg in almost every Pixar movie that was originally seen in Toy Story. There's also this boat, Elena, a nod to the character of Abuelita from 2017's Coco. While preparing to test out their makeshift Vespa, Alberto looks at a photo of Marcello Mastroianni, a famous Italian actor who appeared in many Fellini films. We'll also get a brief snippet of one of these films, Big Deal on Madonna Street from 1958. The end credits are also filled with little homages like Julia's mother's dog Nerone and the turtle Caligula, both named after Roman emperors. We see Alberto get a knife as a gift from Massimo, something he wanted earlier in the film. Here's a quick reference to Lady and the Tramp, as well as two fish who could be Dory and Nemo. And just as you thought the movie was over, there's actually a post credit scene where Uncle Ugo rambles on about life in the deep to one of Luca's fish. It's not like a Marvel post credit scene where it sets up something, it's just a fun little ending. Now there is a final easter egg the director said is out there, but is very difficult to find. He said that it hints at Pixar's next film, Turning Red, about a 13 year old who turns into a red panda every time she gets excited. The closest thing I could find is this red panda like thing here, which could just be an homage to Studio Ghibli. After all, the director said one of his main influences for Luca was Studio Ghibli, and they even did a film called Porco Rosso, which is extremely close to Porco. Porto Rosso, but I'm sure this final Easter egg will be revealed in the days and weeks ahead. I want to hear what you thought about Luca and which Easter eggs I missed in the comments below. Thanks for watching everyone, make sure to like and subscribe, every little bit helps me and the channel out. For more bad takes, you can always follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT, and until next time remember, Daddy loves you very much.